It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. With those iconic words, astronaut Neil Armstrong took his first step onto the moon on July 20th, 1969. The Apollo 11 mission became one of the most significant moments of the 20th century, and NASA estimates that 500 million people around the world tuned in to watch the historic event on live TV. Damien Chazelle chose this topic for his follow-up to 2017 musical La La Land. His new film, First Man, tells the personal story of Armstrong, who commanded the mission in the decade leading up to Apollo 11 and concluding with his historic moonwalk. Last month, First Man opened the Venice Film Festival, receiving a three-minute standing ovation and immediate Oscar buzz. I'm Carolyn Jardina, and for this week's Behind the Screen podcast, we'll learn how visual effects supervisor Paul Lambert helped Damien Chazelle put moviegoers on the moon. Paul will not only share the visual effects tricks behind First Man, but the research that included examining NASA archives and even speaking with two of the heroic astronauts who went to space with the late Armstrong, Apollo 11 lunar module pilot Buzz Aldrin, who danced on the surface of the moon with Armstrong, and Michael Collins, the mission's command module pilot. First Man's visual effects supervisor, Paul Lambert, won his first Academy Award in March as part of the visual effects team on Denny Villeneuve's Blade Runner 2049. Earlier in his career, he worked on the first three Harry Potter movies and served as compositing supervisor on visual effects Oscar winner The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Today, he's a visual effects supervisor at DNEG, the lead visual effects house on First Man, whose Oscar winning work included Interstellar and Inception. Paul, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Now, this was your first film with Damien Chazelle. What was the collaborative process like? Damien is a director who very much knows what he wants. Like, when I first met him, I was actually still finishing Blade Runner. And I flew down to L.A. and I met him and we spoke about about how I like to do visual effects. And basically, I told him that, how I like to try and get as much in camera in one pass rather than try and break, break everything down. And, like, he seemed... He seemed really keen with that idea. And when I was confirmed on the show, he sent me what he termed his notebook, which was a 300-page PDF file, which outlined the entire movie with, like, different different aspects, different sounds, different visuals which were inspiring him. And I'd never actually come across, you know, like, such an insight to the mind of a uh, filmmaker. And, and also he, he sent me some of his animatics, basically storyboards, which which like he had already cut to music and the music which you hear in the film now is was the same music that was in the animatic so this was like months before any shooting and stuff like him and justin had basically composed the score already like a year beforehand so obviously what you hear now is a much better version but i basically picked up that tune and i've been humming it for the past year you know it's become a little bit of an obsession but you, but yeah damien very much knows what he wants and he provided animatics with like archival footage and stuff and I knew that on this particular project that we would have reference for every aspect of of all the space journeys you know whether it be photographs or whether it be footage from the time so we didn't really want to deviate from that you know like uh, you know he wanted to keep it gritty in a documentary style as if it had been shot from that particular time period and all of the heads of departments would meet every day about different aspects of the movie and and like we were constantly changing around if like something should be done in miniature or something should be done full cg or if like something would, would be done with what we termed the bigature which is like an 80 percent size scale of, of the models but yes it was it was constant conversations like i went to atlanta three months before the shoot and and like we just talked and talked and talked and watched visuals about about okay how exactly are we going to do this now you mentioned the the whole team so that included production designer nathan crawley who created the detailed period settings and lena sangren cinematography an artful combination of 16 millimeter 35 millimeter and imax film formats but it all came together so seamless and realistic how did you pull that off yes yes like there was a huge push to like try and try and do as much in camera as possible you know Damien Damien wanted to avoid any form of green screen or blue screen you know like he, he always wanted a 
location or like a, or a way in which it would help the crew and actually help the actors perform rather than shooting a specific scene in the in front of a green screen so like we came up with a simple philosophy in that if a shot was going to have part of something which we built close up we would want to use the full scale or the 80% scale practical if it was a mid shot we would use a miniature like we would use one of Ian Hunter's uh, one sip scale miniature or if it was a wide shot it was okay to go all CG and it worked really well really well now the film was shot in Atlanta and at Cape Canaveral in it Florida, was, yeah. and you work closely with NASA. Yes. First Man even incorporated some archival footage that had never been shown to the public, as yes. I understand it. What was involved in the research, and how did you use that footage? Okay, so like when I joined the show, like I knew that that like there would be reference for every single aspect of this movie for like all the journeys, whether it be photographs or whether it be um, moving imagery. So we started to receive footage. Where like we saw different different Apollo missions and different different Gemini missions and and it became apparent that like some of this footage that we could perhaps use in the movie now all this footage was uh, shot slow motion and it was very much archival in that like it was had scratches and it was and it was bouncing around and, and one thing which Damien you know when we started to talk about the possibility of of uh, being able to use archival footage Damien was insistent that the moment that the audience feels it's archival, we lose them. So the emphasis was was to really try and use this footage in a way in which you couldn't tell that it was archival. So we took some pieces of footage and we cleaned it up to a point where it was so pristine, so clean, almost digital, that like when you put it back in, into the edit, it kind of popped out for not actually fitting into the cut. So once we got to that point, we knew that we were able to uh, then degrade the footage once again to actually match to the surrounding footage as if it had been shot with the same camera. And all that footage is in an aspect ratio which isn't very cinematic. So what we did on a lot of that work was take the frame and actually and fit it into the aspect ratio of the movie and then extend it either side with a computer graphic. So like, for example, the shot you see of the Saturn V first igniting and you see the clouds, you see two plumes of clouds appearing either side. Well, that centre section is actually original 70 millimetre footage of the Apollo 14 taken off, which we then extended with a computer graphics. What was it like to have the opportunity to go through those archives? Oh, it's absolutely amazing. You know, you saw so many different missions, but also, like, you know, every mission had what they called engineering cameras. Like, they would be uh, either focused on the thruster or they would be focused on a particular clamp. And the idea being that if, the, if there had ever been a problem with one of the launches, they could then investigate what happened and view all of these cameras. So that you had a room in one of the bases down in there the uh, US where you have all these reels of like film which like some of them unopened which people hadn't seen before and my producer Kevin Elam went down with uh, a light box and like some spools and he just went old school and just viewed this footage because also a, a lot of the footage was on a format which you can't view anymore because it was on a it was on NASA military 70 millimeter stock which like there just aren't machines to view this anymore. So, and it took us months to actually get like a proper scan of this material. Like, we finally found a place in London which had a experimental scanner which didn't use sprockets. So, like, we could actually actually get this film scanned so that we could actually use it properly. And then, among the people that you talked with during that research phase was Apollo 11's Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins. What was it like to meet them and what sort of things did you discuss? Yeah, so so Buzz Buzz appeared on one of the uh, shooters and it was a very brief conversation just to say hello. And Mike was there for a day as well, but Mike also appeared in post as we were finishing off the visual effects. And we had advisors throughout the entire shoot, you know, uh, advising us about uh, about certain things, about the gauges and about different heights of, like, say, of, say, the X-15. And it's funny because one of them, he had just watched the movie and, like, he was so intrigued that, like, we had resurrected the LLTV. He, he honestly thought that, like, 
we had built a and <laughs> built a natural flying replica of the LTV, the lunar landing training vehicle. So it's what was termed at the time the flying bedstead, and it's kind of the unsung hero of like the whole Apollo program because it gave the astronauts the ability to feel like what it would be like flying in zero g but it was very very unstable and it's where neil crashes and like he just he just ejects just in time 10,000 feet switching the lunar mode we're too low climb control is degrading slow your rate do you read neil Our special effects supervisor, J.D. Schwamm, actually built the LLTV like full scale. And what we did is we hung it from, from computerized cranes and then and then shot it from a helicopter and from a Russian arm, so that like it it gave the impression of translational movement. But all it was doing was just rotating in in, in the air. But it was very effective. So the film took us on a journey to Neil Armstrong's historic walk on the moon. How did you craft that particular scene? Okay, so. For that particular, uh, once they had touched down on the moon, um, Nathan Crowley found this this uh, great quarry, which was an in-use quarry, but um, he found an area where like, he was able to dress five acres of uh, ground to actually look like the original moon landing area. And uh, the visual effects work involved having to remove the mounds which you saw in the distance, as well as the astronauts nearly always had their gold visors down, and that and that kind of acts like a chrome ball on set. I, basically, you get to see everything. You get to see this huge IMAX camera. You get to see the the crew, and then like you get to see all the footsteps and all the marks left by humans everywhere. And and we had one particular shot, which was a 360 degree pan, where you know there just isn't anywhere to hide. So the so the visual effects work was was about cleaning up the camera from the visors, extending the horizon, cleaning up the mounds, which you saw in the distance, and then adding certain subtleties. So like when you see them walking or jumping or, or any kind of movement, we would add some computer-generated dust to their footsteps so that like it appeared in slow motion. And also the stunt coordinator, Jim Churchman, came up with a bungee system which like he calibrated so that it felt like one six gravity where we attached to the astronauts and every time they like walked walked or bounced they actually had this sense that they were on the moon. So so part of the work as well was removing those cables and that kind of thing. Now you, you built a lot and used models and miniatures what else was involved in creating the space set scenes? Yeah, so in trying to keep with this philosophy of like trying to get everything in camera, like we came up with a uh, pretty simple philosophy in that if a shot was going to have one of our crafts close up, we would either use the full size craft or the 80% scale version of the craft. Or if it was a mid shot, we would want to use the one six scale miniatures built by Ian Hunter's team, or if it was a wide distance shot, we were going to use all CG. And obviously with a production, there are times when like you have to chop and change it. But like the idea was to like try and stick to that philosophy. And one of the techniques that we came up was, was that any of the CG content which we were going to create for the movie, we were going to play back on a massive LED screen, which we built on one of the stages in Atlanta, which was like 35 foot tall and 60 foot wide, like a like a half a cylinder. And it's an absolutely massive screen. But the idea was that we would provide content for the screen, which would then get shot with the film camera. So instantly you get the actual computer graphics going through the film camera, which then gave it the grain and it gave it gave it a look which which like fit with the uh, rest of the film and I don't think we were really ready for how much content we actually had to provide because usually you know all of our work is done post you know you, you do a green screen and then after that you fill it in but for this one to like try and keep things as realistic as possible we had to produce the all, all the content prior and usually in my world you work say on like specific shots you'll have a five second shot and you work 
towards that time frame, but Damien wanted to have entire sequences. So, like, we actually had to render, like, the entire X-15 drop from the B-52 and into the clouds, up through the atmosphere, the bounce on the atmosphere, and then the actual land has one entire clip. We had gone up in a helicopter and a jet to, like, try and get some actual footage, and we kept the helicopter footage of like skimming over some mountain ridges and landing on a lake bed but all the jet work was we couldn't really use because we didn't have the clouds which we uh, which we wanted and it's very difficult to, to actually get a pilot to actually fly through clouds so all that sky work was actually computer generated which was rendered during the six weeks period before like uh, actually shots and we had to do an entire launch for the Gemini and for the Apollo and for the approach to the moon you know the idea being that even when you had interactions with the astronauts inside the capsule the content is still moving behind so that like you actually see it in reflections in there even though like you're not actually looking through the window but you get to see it in their visors and you get such a subtlety as well that you can see the reflections in their eyes you know there's a shot in particular where where you see Ryan just break through the atmosphere and you see the horizon line on his visor but then you also get to see it on his eye and I used to do the work you know I used to be on the box myself and I know how incredibly tricky it is to actually pull that off to, to actually get that kind of subtlety in a composite and here because we had changed things around we're actually getting that for free and and also Ryan was able to act to the fact that he was seeing the horizon rather than a queue. Like, say, OK, and the horizon's covered in now, Ryan, you know, and so, like, he could actually see it and actually feel it, you know, and, and of course, he was on a gimbal being being shook uh, for the entire day as well, you know. For, <laughs> so. Did you get to try it too? No, no, I, I didn't... <laughs> I didn't want to do it because one thing as well, and during the uh, during the spin sequence, for example, for the Gemini, you know, rather than rotate the capsules with the two actors in there, obviously we rotated the content on the screen because the screen is so big. And when you watched it a couple of times, you actually felt motion sick. So so each time each time the content came up, the entire crew would turn around because nobody wanted to watch that. And the last thing I wanted to do was be in be in the craft and watch this thing. And, and shook like crazy. It's like, you know, the actors did go through various various skin tones <laughs> during those <laughs> <laughs> during those shoots for sure. How did Ryan and Corey do inside the capsule when you were filming? You know, they did uh, remarkably well. We had various uh, techniques to like try and get them to be in zero G. So uh, there were like a couple of days where like we had them attached to uh, wires so that they could float around the capsules. But a lot of the work as well like was like old school techniques where uh, where like they just stood on one leg and kind of just pretended to float but but also you know being inside the capsule and like seeing the led screen through through the capsule i think i think gave them gave them like a, a really good sense of where they were and 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 like uh, how to react to certain scenes that, you know having that particular setup where they could actually see the content prior or rather than a green screen i think helped them fantastically since you had various film formats and an IMAX release, what resolutions did you work at? For the main body of the movie prior to the IMAX, everything was done at 2K, and we had shot 2 perf, 3 perf, and 4 perf, and 16 millimeters. So, like, there were a multitude of like different resolutions, but like, we had a common common container which was 2K, but the IMAX footage was scanned at 8K and we worked at 6K. And the IMAX footage was the surface of the moon. Yes, that scene exactly. So, so there is a particular shot where Neil opens the hatch, and so anything inside the capsules was shot 16 millimeter. And the idea was that when Neil opens the hatch, it's all 16 millimeters, but then. As you see outside, that's actually IMAX footage. So as the camera rushes through that door, that's when like we open to the 143 IMAX footage. It's such a contrast because the uh, 16 millimeter footage is is like very grainy and like the camera's always moving and it's shot documentary style. And then like you go out onto the moon and the camera's on always on a crane and and it's still and it's 
and it's smooth and it's incredibly clean. So it's a huge contrast. So tell us a little bit about you. You're from the UK yes. originally. How did you find the visual effects business? Oh my goodness. I kind of stumbled into this business. I I had gone to college and I uh, did, uh, ironically, a degree in rocket science. I was, <laughs> I, I was learning aeronautics at the time and I finished the... I finished so the, this was the perfect project yeah, for you. Well, <laughs> I uh, finished the, the uh, degree and and realized well I, this isn't really what I wanted to do. You know, I had people in my class who who could look up into the sky and and like see an aircraft and and say what the tire pressure was. And I just I didn't have that that you know that that interest. So I got a little bit lost and I then went to art school. I had this incredible desire to to be creative and like I had always been good at art uh, during uh, during school. So it was during during my second year at art school that like I got a part-time job and I was working for a company which provided steam backs and chems and moviolas and avids and lightworks to uh, to various film productions at Pinewood and at Shepperton and it was there that things start to spark my interest and and like I came across visual effects which which to me just seemed like the perfect blend of of like what I was you know it was something highly technical but but also something which was driven by the visuals and once it occurred to me that okay this is what I want, wanted to do I just put the blinkers on and, and it took me six months to, to actually get into one of the post-production uh, facilities in Soho in the in the uh, UK but once I was in I, I never look back. <laughs> now, for First Man, the timing of this story is particularly appropriate, as 2019 marks the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission. How will you look at this anniversary differently, having completed First Man? Uh, you know, I knew about certain aspects of the uh, space program, and, and you know, to me, just like Damien, it was like something which occurred, but like I never actually lived through it. So, having gone through this particular project, where like, uh, where like I learned every single aspect of it, you know, like a, before I joined production, like I just finished Blade Runner, I spent two weeks of just uh, I spent. 24 7 just going through every single space documentary every single space film like just just to fill my mind and that and that obviously continued through prep and and like what you learn about the whole mission and that is it, it, it's like to actually go up there in these essentially tin cans up <laughs> up into space where like where like anything could have could have gone wrong was was just absolutely amazing and the amount of people and 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 what it took so to me it's very odd that like a movie hadn't actually been done about about like the actual you know his life and 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 getting to the moon and the fact that it's 50 years next year is amazing so having worked on the movie and it coming out just now before before like a plethora of documentaries and and like other things which will obviously be coming out for the 50th anniversary was was absolutely fantastic thank you so much for joining us congratulations on the film thank you so much 